Hi folks, thank you for joining us today. My name is Spencer Belanger and today we are here to discuss the short oral presentation panel on thinking critically about social determinants and our health. This session will last from 2 to 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, we're going to begin with an introduction of our panelists as we lead into the, their individual presentations and then at the end we're going to come back together with a live question and answer period and discussion. Before we get started, I'd like to address a few housekeeping items. Firstly, CBRC has established some community guidelines for the summit to help ensure a safe, respectful, and inclusive experience for everyone. This includes respecting personal experiences and ensuring that we are sharing the space with other participants. Please refer to the summit 2021 page on the CBRC website for more information on these guidelines for participation. Today, we are also joined by Luke Gray, who will monitor the chat to help uphold these guidelines. We understand that some of the content and discussions may be difficult to hear and encourage any participant in need to access our counseling support. On the summit participant directory located on the conference platform, a counseling coordinator will be listed. The coordinator will help connect you with a counselor for an informal active listening and supportive session. We also encourage folks to post their questions or comments into the chat box, but we will be holding all audience questions until after the panel's presentations. Please be aware that there will be automated closed captioning available in both English and French. Lastly, we are recording today's session, which will be published within a couple of days on this platform. Therefore, we ask that you refrain from recording today's session yourself. At the end of the session, you are welcome and invited to share your feedback using our evaluation form, which will be available when you scroll down on the page and select the evaluations button. <clears throat> so first on our agenda today is the presentation on situating long-term care as a question of housing and homelessness presented by Celeste Pang. Celeste is an anthropologist and ethnographer whose research focuses on intersections of aging, disability, gender and sexuality, and care. Celeste has been part of multiple projects to do with access and equity in relation to aging, including SSHRC funded doctoral research focused on the experiences of LGBTQ older adults living in long term care. She currently works as a senior research officer at EGAL Canada. I'm looking forward to your presentation. We can cue that up now. Thank you. Hello and welcome to our panel. Uh, my name is Celeste Pang and I am a PhD candidate in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto and also a senior research officer in the research department at EGAL Canada. Today I'm going to be presenting on some of my doctoral research in a presentation titled Situating Long-Term Care as a Question of Housing and Homelessness. So I'd like to begin by giving you a brief background on the research I conducted leading to the observations and discussions that I hope to spark today. So in the summer of 2015 and from October 2016 to November 2017, I conducted a total of 16 months of multi-sided ethnographic fieldwork among LGBTQ plus identified older adults residing in long-term care homes and quote unquote in the community or in non-institutional settings in Toronto, Canada. This involved participant observation following eight key interlocutors living in two different long-term care homes. Um, these interlocutors included people who identified um, as gay, so included four gay men, uh, two trans women, two bisexual or pansexual women, and one transmasculine person. I also conducted two sets of interviews. So the first was with 50 LGBTQ identified people over 60-ish about their experiences and perspectives on aging and care. Um, and the second set of interviews were with 70 quote unquote surrounding actors. So these included paid and unpaid carers, including of uh, key interlocutors with their permission. It included long-term care home staff from personal care aides to managers, as well as interviews with community activists, legal advocates, and others involved uh, in queer and trans aging and care issues, mainly uh, 
in Ontario and the Toronto area. So what I'd like to present um, in this brief eight minute presentation is a call to reframe thinking about long-term care from care to housing. Um, why this reframing? So first is to expand from a dominant focus on care in research and advocacy concerning LGBTQ and to us LGBTQI older adults. Um, I use those two different acronyms to encompass who I engaged with in my research, but also the communities I think this re reorientation can matter for. To reorient from dominant understandings of long-term care homes, first and foremost, as a site of care and as a site of death um, towards reimagining them or reimagining um, other ways that we can provide housing, shelter, and care for one another. And to recognize that long-term care homes are also an important site of shelter, housing, and continued living. Um, so the reorienting questions uh, that I've posed to myself and I'd like to pose to you as a bit of a provocation and also as you listen through the two ethnographic vignettes that follow are the following. So one, are people who live in long-term care homes homeless? What does long-term care have to do with poverty and housing precarity? And three, how have LGBTQ older adults aging with and into disability made long-term care homes their homes and what can be imagined into emergent futures. So with that, I'd like to shift to tell you uh, two brief stories or ethnographic vignettes based on people who I came to know living in long-term care. And the names of both are pseudonyms and I've disguised identifying details. Lucia. I met Lucia in the fall of 2016 an introduction from a long-term care home recreation worker and a conversation with Lucia and her cousin, who was her attorney for personal care at the time. I visited with Lucia for nearly a year. We had a warm, joking relationship. She told me many stories, especially about her childhood and her past loves. She would also tell me regularly about how she had lost her apartment, moving from a small town to the city and working in stores throughout her life. Lucia had held three downtown addresses in and around the gay village that she would recite with the shine in her eye. Lucia had been living in the long-term care home for an extraordinary number of years, over 10 when I met her, having been moved in directly from the hospital after she suffered a brain aneurysm. Lucia was sore about what she saw as her robbed autonomy, as well as the loss of most of her things, which had been given away when it became clear she was not leaving the home. While Lucia had short-term memory loss, she was able to get around and communicate quite independently. And with uh, her rented apartment long since given up, she had nowhere else to stay and nowhere else to go except for the long-term care home. Maurice. I met Maurice in the winter of 2017. Originally from Quebec, earlier in life Maurice had worked in the entertainment industry following his departure from high school and moves to the big city. Maurice was a lover of art, with paintings from friends on the wall around his bed in his half of a shared room, and he liked to chat about old movies and plans for new tattoos. From a working class family, Maurice had been estranged from his relatives since his teen years, and struggling with internalized homophobia had turned to substance use, and after a lifetime of working had not accumulated savings to see him into old age. In his early 60s, Maurice arrived to long-term care directly from a men's shelter where he had been staying. Following a stroke, with the help of the social worker, he secured a bed in a long-term care home. While eligible, due to his need for assistance with activities of daily living, living in the home also afforded Maurice access to a stable place to shelter, three meals a day, and some degree of community or others there where he was recognized as a gay man. So to turn to our first two provocations, um, the people who I came to meet living in long-term care homes arrive there uh, in a variety of ways. So as I mentioned, from a men's shelter, also from seniors housing, from rental apartments, and from bro uh, rooming houses. Um, and significantly, there is a strong relationship between poverty and long-term care home dwelling, including especially in major urban centers. 
the very idea of a long-term care home itself can be traced to the poorhouse and the asylum and has its roots in the Elizabethan poor law of uh, 1601 um, in Britain, um, at least in Ontario and the, the Anglophone homes in Canada. Um, these are facilities that originally were used to house people unable to care for themselves or to provide for themselves financially. Um, there is a very strong critique of institutionalization and disability justice movements. Um, there is, I think, less historicization of how long-term care has come to be as it is today than there could be, with key exceptions, including the work of Tamara Dali at York University. So this is to say that these roots of the long-term care home continue to echo in how things are organized and thought about and the investments uh, in the homes, but moreover in the people who come to live there um, today, which begs the question of what are the alternatives. And second, I'd like to think about um, the third question that I posed and the practices of making a home. Um, so I think we can have many conversations and a lot of action needs to be taken on how do we create other forms of housing and care for people, including LGBTQ identified people or people of various um, sexual identities, sexualities, genders and gender expressions into the future. I think it's also important to remember what exists now and the ways that people continue to make lives now, including queer lives and forms of expression. Uh, so this includes friendships formed in long-term care homes as a form of intimacy. It includes uh, decorating as placemaking and queer expression. It includes exercising choice within limited options um, and expanding ideas of aging in place and what does that mean especially when not everybody has an owned home to age in or a solid community network to provide for them. How can we imagine futures in which people can feel a sense of community and belonging um, you know, and implodedness in place in a way that matters to them? Um, so I'm already going a little bit over my time, so I will wrap up. Where do we go from here? So one, take up long-term care housing and affordable housing activism. Two, build opportunities for placemaking and relationship building within existing homes. Three, learn more about the roots of housing and care sectors. And uh, finally, and quite importantly, imagine new forms of housing and care that can serve people regardless of their financial wealth and affiliations to provide supportive conditions of care and of care work and to honor and enable ongoing ways of life. Thank you. Thank you to Celeste for your presentation. It was very illuminating on reframing some of these issues and how we approach them. And I look forward to discussing it further at the end of this panel. Next, we have the presentation on pressure to be masculine associated with poorer mental health gay, sorry, poorer mental health among gay, bisexual, trans, two-spirit, queer men, and non-binary people, presented by Sarah Cooper. <clears throat> Sarah is currently working as a research assistant at the University of Montreal School of Public Health. Sarah is currently working with the QO Lab to try and understand the role of stigma theory, in particular, its impact on mental health in Quebec and Canada. She's currently a doctoral student at ESPUM in the Global Health Option and is interested in women's health and community health. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Oral Presentation Summit 2021. So before I start, I recognize that the University of Montreal is located on land that is part of the unceded traditional territory of the Yeni Gehaga, which has long served as a place of gathering and exchange among Indigenous nations. I will be presenting to you today this project, which is called Pressure to Be Masculine, Associated with Poor Mental Health Among Gay, Bisexual, Trans, Two-Spirit, and Queer Men, and Non-Binary People. My name is Sarah Cooper and I use she, L pronouns. I was also supported by the many co-authors on this project, which are mentioned here on the slide.
So just to start with a bit of background information before we get into the bulk of the results. Um, gay, bisexual, trans, two-spirit, and queer men and non-binary people, which I will refer to as GBTQ, experience a high burden of mental health problems. Minority stress is a theory used to understand the process that affects the mental health of sexual minorities due to internal and external processes like discrimination or stigmatization. The day-to-day -day functioning of LGBTQ and social spheres such as the family or workplace could be gravely affected by the perceived stress and mental health programs associated with being a sexual minority. GBTQ individuals whose gender expression does not conform to societal expectations are potentially at greater risk of rejection, discrimination, and social high backlash. It is hypothesized in the literature that those GBTQ exp who express as masculine have better physical and mental health outcomes than those who express as non-masculine. However, little research has looked at both the role of gender expression and the pressure to adhere to strict masculine gender roles on the mental health of GBTQ. Thus, the secondary analysis aims to explore the, and measure the role of pressures to conform to masculine norms and the mental health of GBTQ+. We were really trying to explore the associations between gender expression and pressure to conform to masculine norms and mental health outcomes. Thus, this is a very exploratory study. Most of you in the audience know about the SexNow data. However, for those who don't know, SexNow is an online survey of gay, bisexual, trans, and queer men and two-spirit and non-binary people in Canada conducted by the Community-Based Research Center each year. We decided to extract the data from those in 2019. And with this data, we measured associations between self-perceived pressure to be masculine and mental health outcomes such as probable depression and self-brain mental health. Probable depression was determined through a validated questionnaire called the PHQ-2, and self-rated mental health measures an individual's perception of their overall mental health using a single question rated on a five-point scale, such as excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor. We also looked at factors such as age, gender, gender expression, income, residence, ethnicity, education level, and presence of disability. Thus, some premier... Uh, preliminary descriptive results. Approximately 60% of our respondents have experienced a form of masculine pressure, either from LGBTQ community, from the general society, or from friends and family. If you look at the figure on this slide, we look at, we look at the difference in proportions across the different avenues of receiving masculine pressure. Thus, participants could choose to respond to this question by choosing receive masculine pressure from friends and family, from the LGBTQ community, or from general society. And we can see on this graph that approximately 50% of our respondents chose general society versus 29% from friends and family, and approximately 25% from the LGBTQ community. Masculine pressure was higher amongst those who described the gender ident identity as mostly feminine, androgynous, and fluid, compared to those who described their gender as masculine. Pressure to be masculine was mo most prevalent or common among those aged under 30 years, old, years of age, non-binary individuals, approximately 84%, pansexual men, indigenous people, people of color, trans people, and identifying with a disability. This table shows the results from an adjusted multivariable regression analysis where the factors on the left were put into the model and the outcome was probable depression. And we can see in this table that pressure to be masculine was associated with an increased odds of having probable depression with an odds ratio of 1.53. And this was statistically significant. Other factors that you can see in bold that were significantly associated with an increased odds of having depression were being a younger age of 45 years old or below, having an androgynous gender expression, having an income of less than $10,000, not having a college or university degree, having previous trans experience, and having a disability. When we looked at the same model but changed the outcome to poor, fair, self-rated mental health, we can see some similarities, but also some differences. Pressure to be masculine was associated with an increased odds of having a poor, fair, self-rated mental health with an odds ratio of 1.61, so a more elevated odds ratio than probable depression, and this was also statistically significant. 
Other factors that were associated with increased odds of having poor fair self rate in mental health were relatively the same as those with probable depression. So being a younger age of 45 years or old, having an income of less than $10,000, not having a college university degree, having previous trans experience and having a disability. However, there were some factors that were different as when we look at the gender expression variable where we can see having an androgynous gender expression or having fluidity between an expression was associated with an increased odds of having a poor or fair self rate mental health, as well having a sexual identity of either only pansexual or only queer or other sexual identities was also found to uh, be significantly associated with increased odds of having poor fair self rated mental health. So what do these results tell us? So trends in this study show a significant association between receiving masculine pressure and poor mental health outcomes amongst GBTQ. However, this is a very preliminary study, like I said at the beginning of this presentation. Thus, the findings support the development of possible interventions to alter norms, reducing pressure in order to decrease the mental health burden of GBTQ. Again, it is important to know that this study is an initial study and masculine pressure might be ubiquitous. However, this calls for more research to truly understand the complexities that underlie these trends that we see. I would like to thank my team again, who have supported me through this research project, as well as the project lead, Dr. Olivier Ferlat. I am now ready for any comments or questions, or you can email me at this email. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your presentation. It certainly resonated with me on a personal level and the ways in which that we as community members navigate masculinity and our perception of self. So I look forward to discussing that further with you at the end of the panel. <clears throat> Next, we have a presentation, or I should say a discussion, on how to implement new gender, sex, and sexual orientation information practices in healthcare to promote health equity for 2S LGBTQAI plus people, presented by Roz Queen. Roz Queen works in health information research on the topics of electronic health records, standards, and equity enabling policies and practices. She studies at the University of Victoria in Coast Salish. They have worked with Transcare BC, Canada Health InfoWay, and HL7's Gender Harmony Project. I'm looking forward to what you have brought forward today, Roz. We can queue up your video now. Hello, CBOs. <laughs> CBOC Summit. Messed up already within the first five minutes. You know it's going to be good. Uh, so I am Bros Queen. I'm here today to talk about um, what the title of my presentation is super long. A discussion of modernizing gender, sex, and sexual orientation practices in digital health systems. I think that's it. So that's it. Um, I'm not going to use slides today just because, A, I only have eight minutes, and I'm sure you have seen so many slides today that you're kind of sick. So I'm just going to talk to my camera uh, and have a little discussion with you. Uh, it's going to, since it's only eight minutes, going to be very high level, kind of skim over a lot of stuff, um, and I'll put down some information at the bottom where you can, um, some links where you can get more information and participate in the project and ask me questions and stuff like that because i'm going to have to skip a bunch of stuff in eight minutes that's just um a fact of the thing um so yeah first of all uh gender sex and sexual orientation that's what i call GISO. that's the abbreviation we use and digital health systems that seems a little confusing so that's stuff like electronic medical records uh, if you have to do any, like, telehealth, if you have to go on a patient portal, which is where you go online and, like, enter in some information or see your past information. So the current context of this is there's very limited um, collection of just so data in current systems, and uh, this there's also a lot of conflation. So people often conflate gender and sex in a very uh, bad way. And this is bad because it leads to assumptions. So it leads to assumptions about who you are, what parts you have, what you want to need out of healthcare. And assumptions in healthcare are very bad all of the time. Um, so this is, just for an example, an exception. If you were born a specific sector, but they 
they think that that means you have certain organs or organelles or want certain things out of your life. But that isn't really the case. Like, you know, we were born like 30 some years ago and a lot has changed since then. So it's not really a useful point of data for a lot of stuff. So my work has been uh, modernizing GISO across can Canadian digital health systems. So this means stuff like adding new fields, adding new options. So this would be stuff like a gender identity field or a pronoun field or a name use field or an organ inventory. So like what organs do you actually have? And, you know, because a lot of them need to be checked regularly, especially as you get older for like cancer and stuff like that. So it's like prostate cancer, cervical cancer, breast cancer, chest cancer, stuff like that. Um, new policy and practices about how to collect, store, and use just so data, and new privacy practices. So, you know, this information is sensitive, like all healthcare information is, uh, so we need to ensure that those sufficient uh, policies in place to protect people and to share it in a way that's helpful to, A, the healthcare professional, and also the patient at the same time. Um, and all of this needs to be anchored by training and education. So it's super great if you add a new um, data field of gender identity and one of the options is uh, gender fluid. But if people don't know what that is or they don't know how to treat a gender fluid person or like what that might imply about them or like stuff like that, it's not really useful at all. So training and education. And this is for obviously like doctors and nurses, um, uh, doctors and nurses, but also other stuff like medical office assistants. So like when you come into um, a front, uh, a walk-in clinic, uh, the people that greet you, uh, the people that like um, do lab tests, the people that take blood, all of those people need to be trained. Um, and that's obviously a large undertaking, but it's an essential part of making sure harm does not happen within the healthcare system, especially for sex and gender minorities. Um, and another big part of my work is introducing a standard, so a health information standard is what they're called. And some of these are like pan, um, like national, and sometimes some of these are international. And this is really important so you can like share and use data across different jurisdictions. So, for example, if um, you know you're a resident of BC but you travel to our border and something happens there and you have to go to an emergency room. With health standards, you would be able to share that data with other people. It's called interoperability. And this also applies to like international standards. Uh, so if you go to a different country and something similar happens, they would be able to get your information um, and treat you appropriately and stuff like that. And it's also important because within Canada, a lot of those, a lot of pan-Canadian organizations like Kaiheim that you need to send data to and that data needs to be sent in a pretty specialized way or a standardized way not specialized. Um, so they can use that information and do analysis and, you know, see really broad um, trends going on within Canadian healthcare. Um, uh, some important addendums to the work is just so data will be only used when clinically relevant, especially sex at birth. Um, you might have heard of this thing, uh, the trans broken arm syndrome, where a trans person goes in with a broken arm and they're like, oh, well, what's your sex at birth? And like, starts get really interested in like the hormone use, or, like stuff like that. That's not clinically relevant and it's not really helpful. And sex at birth most of the time isn't really clinically relevant, but it can be for certain stuff such as um, interpreting, <laughs> interpreting uh, blood results and blood tests and stuff like that. Um, and da, da, da. another important point is gender identity takes the president over sex assigned at birth. Um, so that is stuff like um, on your wristbands when you're in a hospital. It should have your gender identity, not your sex at birth. And where you get placed in a hospital in terms of rude placement should also be gender identity, not sex at birth. This is actually part of the Canadian Human Rights Act. And there was, um, there was a ruling this year that pronoun use is included with that. Uh, but if it's actually followed, that's kind of an open question. Uh, but it should be followed, and there is precedent for this, and there's policy about it, but actually how it comes into practice. Okay, so I got a minute left. Um, so conclusions. Um, so how can you help and join, if you want to help and join, which I hope you do. I think it's interesting, but I'm annoyed. Um, so we're part of Canadian Health InfoWay, and we have monthly meetings we have two monthly meetings, one all just like a general meeting where we have presentations and one is a more specific for a specific setting, uh, specific area. 
And we have upcutting meanings on settings. So this is acute and tertiary kale, and then also primary kale. And I think it would be really important to have sex and gender minority people in those meetings, because, you know, this is going to impact you a lot of the way and probably already currently impacts you. So if you want to try and make that a little better for all communities, that'd be really great. Um, there's a website that I created um, that has, you know, there's all of the information, links up for other stuff. It's, I think, pretty easily to read and it gives you a big overview of stuff. So if you have it, more, uh, more questions, you can have to do that. And then there's also a survey if you want to offer any uh, anonymous feedback to us. I would really appreciate that. And I'll also plug in um, my email out there at the end. So I'll just pop those all in chat um, when this wraps up. So yeah, that's eight minutes. I know that's a lot of information real quick. Uh, I'll be around in the Q&A section. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for listening. I know you probably had a lot to do today and I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Okay, bye. Thank you, Roz, for that discussion. It was very lovely to see how you approach this work within healthcare institutions to promote equity within them for folks who are marginalized accessing these systems. I know there is certainly overlap between work that you're doing and the work that I'm doing locally to Alberta with the Trans Wellness Initiative. Um, <clears throat> this is the portion of the panel where we can open up the floor for questions from folks in attendance. You can utilize the chat box or the Q&A function. Um, and we'd love to hear a wide variety of questions for our lovely presenters, day, presenters today and the work that they're doing in their respective regions. Um, I don't see any questions right off the bat here, which is great because I actually have a few. <laughs> so let's start with you, Roz, and the discussion that you just shared with us here. Um, as I know in my line of work with the Trans Wellness Initiative, um, a lot of the job sometimes is reminding practitioners and healthcare providers of the practices and standards that they are be held to legally and like, you know, human rights legislation and things like that, where it's like a lot of the times this, the rights of our community are enshrined in legislation, but seeing that in action is sometimes a completely different story. So from your perspective, what are some barriers that make operationalizing these equity enabling practices, standards and policies that you brought forth within healthcare institutions? That's a really good question. It's a really big question, um, but uh, I think it's a really good one. Yeah, there's obviously a lot of barriers, and like uh, Spencer said, like, you know, legislation is all good, or policies and practices, or like professional bodies, like the doctors of Vichy, they can put like pressure on individual doctors, because if you violate enough rules, you'll lose your license, and that's usually a bad time. Um, but if that actually filters down to practice, and like, Training and education is great, but it's hard to know if that sticks and if that carries forward with a lot of stuff. So that's a pretty key barrier. And then there's also barriers of like, you know, healthcare was very, very busy all the time, especially with the um, COVID um, pandemic and stuff like that. So it's kind of uh, an important question is if organizations all have the readiness to do this, like they might have the willingness, but they might not have the capacity to do this. And especially when you talk about, uh, uh, healthcare professional burnout, but like they're already overburdened with a lot of stuff and they have to like, you know, document all the things and um, meet like 100 patients a day and stuff like that. Adding another thing to that pile for them can be really quite overwhelming and they might come to resent the work because of that. Um, I think it definitely needs to be done and there's a lot of home going on and like the status quo is very harmful and violent for a lot of people and shifting it requires quite a lot of work and it requires a lot of like investments in terms of money, training, resources, workflow analysis, seeing how we can fit in these questions into existing uh, structures, because we don't just want to go and like blow up everything. We'll be like, these are some additional questions, or these are some additional considerations as you're like ordering lab services or stuff like that. And I think uh, like my field, health information, like automatic um, reminders and like flags and alerts uh, can be really helpful for that. Uh, just in particular in the names of like name, use, and pronouns, if you can have that in like the banner ball of an uh, electronic health record where like every page you see, you know, what pronoun someone uses or on the wristbands, it's like uh, prominently displayed. So you can try to use the technology to reduce some home and increase equability. Sure. Yeah. 
I so appreciate that response because in my experience with working with healthcare providers and the folks that we invited to be a part of the introduction to affirming spaces training and the trans wellness initiative in Alberta is that so many folks who are also community members within these healthcare institutions um, <clears throat> have to be very creative and find ways to work within the systems that exist and how like there are so many missed opportunities for screening of particular issues that folks may be coming in with because of how binary the system is. So I certainly really appreciate the work that you're doing to kind of build back up from the ground up a more equitable system for folks. Um, uh, we actually have a question from Celeste here in the chat. Does anyone know about any good integrated education efforts in professional programs or certifications, especially for allied health workers, for example, PSWs or medical secretaries, as mentioned? So this was really an open open to the audience mm -hmm. uh, question based on on some of what Roz mentioned and in your really amazing chat. Yeah, for sure. Does anyone have any thoughts in regard to this or any folks in the audience who have uh, resources or insights to share? Uh, yeah, well, can I take that if that's cool? <laughs> of course, please don't yeah. jump right in. Uh, so someone in the chat just mentioned Radio Health Ontario, though they have a lot of really good resources. There's also, um, I think it's LGBTQ Nursing, which has a lot of online training mole molecules, mo modules, and they have like some videos of like um, mock patients or like use cases and stuff like that. And um, I think in Nova Scotia, there's one about prescribing um, hormones to people. And a lot of those also count as like continuing education credit. So if you're a healthcare professional, you need to get like a certain amount a year to like keep your license and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, with like, you know, stuff going online, there's actually quite a lot available online in terms of like modules. And if you look into like TransCare BC or like uh, um, TPATH, like um, or WPATH, uh, you can, they usually link you to resources or like sometimes you can straight up just like email people and be like, hey, I know this is a deficiency or I don't know a lot about this. Can you point me towards some stuff? Um, like if you want to email me, I can send you some links to the stuff I just discussed. Uh, but yeah, I think it's really good um, for stuff like that. And if you can do it and if you can, you know, either get paid for it or like get some credits out of it or something, I think those like you get something out of it and you do better servicing. Oh yeah, Kurt, thank you so much, Kurt. Uh, I remember Kurt telling me about that at the summer. Um, so those are my thoughts. For sure, thank you for that, Roz. Any other comments or considerations in regard to um, educational efforts that are happening across the country for kind of improving these systems or helping people navigate them in a way that is meaningful? Well, what I can say as a final comment on this um, is the work that we're doing. And like, not the, to like toot my own horn here because I cannot critique my own work. However, with the introduction to affirming spaces training that we've put together in Alberta, uh, it's not an accredited course because we wanted it to be as accessible as possible for folks from within many different varieties of healthcare professions. And I think one of the major limitations of this work, like we had discussed, is that we can speak to practitioners, you know, ad nauseum about navigating within these systems to kind of make it a little more inclusive and more friendly. But if broader structural change does not kind of lead that type of work, then folks are constantly going to be um, limited in what it is that they can actually do for their patients and kind of having that information recognized legally and professionally within those systems. So certainly something that we are working on and looking to address on a broader structural level. Um, but for now, training is where we have uh, to our efforts to focus on. So um, shifting gears here, I had a question for you, Sarah. Um, from your lovely presentation. Um, I found the graph particularly interesting where you compared the three different types of societal or of pressures that folks face to be masculine from within the LGBTQ community, from their families and from society. So from your perspective, how does pressure to be masculine from within the LGBTQ community differ from other familial and societal pressures people face in terms of its impact on an individual's self-image? Very, uh, 
very interesting question. Um, so from what we tried to explore in the data, because we did, we did want to see if the pressure that one experienced from uh, general society versus LGBTQ versus uh, friends and family was different in terms of was there factors uh, that were different? Did one group experience more uh, disparaging health outcomes? And from the data, it wasn't completely complete and it didn't show any differences. So the main difference that we saw was just that in terms of the distribution of those who did experience masculine pressure that you saw in the graph. However, uh, again, this was a very an exploratory uh, study and there needs to be much more investigation into these different forms of pressure that one receives uh, and not just looking at pressure in a very uh, one unidimensional sense, but at these di different dimensions that you uh, suggested. I don't know if that explains <laughs> your um, or answers your question. Well, it certainly does, and I appreciate that response because it really resonated with me in my personal experiences in navigating queer spaces because this may be a similar experience for other folks, but I think a lot of the pressures to be masculine, say, from society and from family are often expected, or mm -hmm. at the very least, um, less jarring than perhaps when people venture out into the community and see those same pressures kind of being redistributed within the community in a way that is very toxic and is very mm -hmm. harmful. And I think from my experience, that was very disheartening to see that being reproduced in the community because when you're young and you're entering into, you know, queer and trans spaces and you expect to be welcomed for wherever you reside on a spectrum of masculinity or femininity and it's really like well no you kind of have to meet these certain standards you kind of no. have to meet this particular face of what masculinity and or femininity looks like and I just found that to be really fascinating in your presentation and how those are measured and would love mm -hmm. in the future to see different bodies of work explore this in a way that is qualitative uh, in terms of how that impacts people on an individual level, but I certainly appreciate the work that has been done so far with you and your team. For sure, for sure. And, you know, this is from like a survey that was in 2019. So I'm sh like, as people know, the Sex Now survey, it, it, it goes out every year, you know, and it's advertised. So the questions change from year to year. So I'm sure in the future, you know, there could be more different questions to reflect these different dimensions or as well, you know, future research that incorporates both the qualitative, but as well the quantitative, like it's sort of mixed methods piece to see where it aligns. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, more research, more trading, more education <laughs> as for always. Sure. Great, thank you for that response, Sarah. Um, in regard to your presentation, Celeste, I have a question. Um, I really appreciated the questions that you had brought forth in reorienting, reorienting this type of work and how we approach housing and uh, long-term care. And something that I was just really curious about is what inspired you to approach these topics and issues through a different lens than say has traditionally been utilized in that line of research? Yeah. Great question. Um, I think honestly, it was spending a year with people in their day-to-day -day lives and just really deeply and, and better understanding that we see institutions and long-term care homes as these totalizing spaces that people enter into and don't come out of, which is very much the case. And, and I'll stress, again, I mentioned it in the presentation, there is a very real and very solid critique of institutionalization of older people and people with disabilities. So I'm by no means arguing for continuing the systems and structures that we have. But I think we do, you know, thinking towards the future, understanding that places like long-term care homes are places where people seek and access care, but also our shelters is a, like an important reorientation for thinking about what kind of housing as well can we build into the future um, for multiple, like, multiple generations of people for people with many different abilities um, so that that's where it came from and that's kind of in in the eight minutes or ten minutes that I sneaked in that's that's where I was re-entering towards is kind of especially with COVID and all that's happened is where do we go from here um, and how can we think about things in different ways to nudge things somewhere else 
sure. Thank you for that response. And I think it really highlights an exciting approach to this line of work through the lens of say community-based research principles of that idea of working alongside and with the community and kind of learning. I know this is my experience that learning that sometimes research protocol or approach to research is not very expansive in terms of the experiences that folks have navigating through those systems. So I certainly really appreciate the reorienting that you've offered here through your work and excited to see the future of this work and where you continue to go with that. Um, do, I think I may have a question in the Q&A here. Um, so someone said, very interested in decorating as placemaking as discussed in your presentations last, and also as a way towards new housing models. I'm not sure if this is important, but I wonder what the place of architects and or designers is in this. I mean, I think it's a very important place. Like I think there are, I know of some efforts in Ontario towards kind of thinking towards what kind of places we can build. I think the work of architects and designers is amazing, super central. And as always, if we're thinking about accessible shelter and care for people across the socioeconomic spectrums is where does the money come from? Mm -hmm. how, how are funding structures reoriented to also support kind of the creativity and expertise um, that design professionals can bring? For sure. Thank you for that response. Um, does any other folks in the audience have any questions for our lovely panelists today? Um, we have about just under 15 minutes left in the session here, but if folks are feeling ready for the day to end, that is also totally fine as well. Um, if you have any other questions, let's throw them into the chat here. Um, <clears throat> let me just take a look here through my notes. All right, well, I am not seeing any further questions from folks in the audience, which is totally fine. I appreciate everybody attending this lovely panel and to our panelists for doing the work that you're doing in respective regions. I am so grateful and appreciative of how you are approaching this work and trying to work alongside the communities um, that we all care about the most. Um, just uh, there was a quick question here. From someone yes the all of the sessions for summit are being recorded and will be uploaded to the cbrc content library in the coming weeks um, so stay tuned on our social media and on our website for that information um, this brings us to a close of the presentations and sessions that we've had today for the second official day of the CBRC Summit 2021. Once again, thanks folks for attending today. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us virtually. Um, we hope to see you tomorrow for the final day of programming. And please remember as you leave the session to share your feedback if you are interested on the session by completing the evaluation form on the Jumbo platform. Uh, thank you everyone for taking the time to be here and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you.